pleasure to be with all of you. I don't generally get to uh, um, start a talk with uh, uh, such a gracious introduction and a prayer to uh, quiet me a little bit as I start. So um, if I don't start with kind of a ramrod of energy, then uh, it's your fault, you know, for... <laughs> so I'd like today to uh, share with you some of the lessons that I've learned from the blessing of having had the opportunity over the last 25 years to listen to a lot of people's stories. Stories from people from all over the world, in all walks of life, people who are entering organizational or social or political life, people who are already very senior uh, in organizations or in politics, nonprofits, people who've uh, fought guerrilla wars for 20 years in the jungle and then they win the war and now they're a bureaucrat and they've got no idea what to do. Uh, people who've been captains of industry and now fi they find themselves having fallen through a trap door and are disoriented. One of the lessons that I've learned from having had this opportunity to listen to the stories of so many people uh, in the middle of their careers is that uh, just like a first-rate hitter in baseball, nobody gets on base more than 40% of the time. So one immediately needs to then begin to examine the degree to which leadership requires a stomach for failure. Because without having a stomach for failure, one loses the flexibility and the plasticity that comes from being able to make mid-course corrections you can't take corrective action if you don't know that there's a correction to be made. And the longer you wait to take corrective action, the longer you fall behind the curve and, run, and risk running out of time. So one of the central questions that I've been asking myself over the years is, what enables an organization to have greater adaptability so that it can respond to a changing environment more quickly and find ways to thrive in that new and challenging environment. So having listened to lots of stories, my job has been to capture lessons from these stories uh, and to try to increase a person's batting average. But again, um, I don't think anybody's going to be able to achieve a 600 or 700 batting average you're still going to fail a lot of the time. And one then still has to return to having that capacity for, I think, what our preacher starting this morning introduced us to as a particular kind of humility. I mean, if God's still working out this great experiment, then we should be able to stay in the game with ourselves, too, knowing that it's quite an experiment. The first, uh, the first insight I've had from listening to these stories is that people commonly confuse leadership with authority. Uh, we see this every day in our common language. Every time we pick up a newspaper, we hear about people who are uh, leaders of a company, the leaders of the House or Senate, the leaders of the school committee, uh, the leaders of uh, a social movement. In all of these cases, we really are referring to people in high positions of authority. We know intuitively that leadership is not the same as authority because in the very next breath, we will complain about the lack of leadership that we're getting from these same people. We'll say the leadership isn't exercising any leadership. But what we really mean to say, if we were a bit more precise in our language, is that people in high positions of authority aren't exercising any leadership. If we distinguish leadership from authority, several things become uh, more available to analysis. The first is we can begin to analyze why is having a high position of authority give you, why does it give you not just a lot of power, resources, and tools to work with, but it also gives you a set of straitjacket constraints limitations on your capacity to lead. We certainly know this when we look at biblical text or at 
political history because we can see how people in high positions of authority are constrained by the expectations of their constituents. We can see in this political season, this presidential season, the degree to which candidates are being pushed to pander to their constituents. That you risk losing the election if you challenge your own people. And in their own ways, each candidate is engaged in doing that. You may prefer one candidate's sales pitch to the other, but each is trying to diminish the amount of challenge to their own core group, saying that the other guy's going to have to, the other faction in the society is going to have to bear more of the pains of change. <laughs> 